Greetings, viewers and listeners. This is Total Turtle with Asantua. I am Marion, your host. Welcome to Did You Know This? Did you know that the nature of beginnings doesn't always determine progress and the end? Our guest today is a professor of chemistry and fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a product of St. John's School at Second D. He holds two first degrees, a BSc General Education and BSc Horns in Chemistry, all from the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. He obtained his PhD in 1985 with a fellowship from the International Atomic Energy Agency to study at the State University of New York and Buffalo. Prior to his PhD studies, he worked with the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission as a trainee scientific officer. After a couple of postdoc fellowships, he worked as a faculty member of Linköping University in Sweden from 1987 to 1997 and returned to the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission as a principal scientific officer and later got promoted to the rank of chief scientific officer. He became a full professor of chemistry at the University of Ghana in Legon in the year 2000 and two years later, became a visiting full professor of chemistry and the first occupant of the Unilever David Ando Chair of Chemistry at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, Ghana. In the year 2003, our guest was engaged as a full professor of chemistry by the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where he became the Dean of School of Graduate Studies from 2005 to 2007. He was appointed as the first rector of the Indian School of Business and Technology located at Abuabo Ayesudo in the Commander Edna Iguafu Ibrim district after obtaining accreditation for the institution. He is a member of the, a number of professional organizations and has served on and chaired numerous professional and statutory boards, both locally and internationally. Our guest, is married to Charlotte and they have four boys, Atu, Eko, Kufi, and Yoko. He's a Christian, a devout Roman Catholic, and a member of the St. Vincent de Paul Society. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Professor James Hawkins Ephraim. Welcome, Prof, to Tittle Tattle with Asantua. Thank you, Marianne. It looks like in your reading, you lift lifted out the whole portion of my journey at the Catholic University College at Fairbury. So I hope oh. when, when your guy, when your guy, <laughs> your guy has that in him. Yes. yes so we, we could start from there. I sometimes intentionally leave things out so that you add it. Oh, okay. So at this point, I will say that if there is anything I have not added, as far as your background is concerned, oh, please okay. add. <laughs> ah, so, all right. So, okay, I will say that I, I thank you so much, Marianne, for the introduction. But apparently, my little sojourn at the Catholic University College was left out. Okay. So and, the first vice chancellor of the Catholic University of Ghana and was there from 2007 to 2015. 2015. Yes. It was eight <laughs> long years of national service. And, and service, service to God. <laughs> yeah. You can call it anyway, national service. <laughs> service. service to God and mankind. <laughs> so, was, Prof, is there anything else you want to add to your background before we go to other areas of your life? Well, I don't know if you, the, the, the primary school is not important, so that one is important. Okay, then I'll just fast track to UCC, you completing UCC with Anis. You taught in the classroom for some time. How did, did the journey from there to becoming a professor happen? Was it a dream? Well, or... well I think that for me, uh, even going to UCC was driven by a dream. The only thing I wanted to be, to be very frank with you, was to be a teacher. Okay. Because at St. John's, 
the brothers of Holy Cross actually introduced me into that. There was a junior who couldn't understand the mathematics that was being taught. So the brother, brother William, Brother William Gates, St. John's, he came to me. I was only one year ahead of this Indian guy, but Brother William came to me and said, James, would you want to tutor this young guy? And I said, why not? An Indian merchant's son who had a lot of money and we're going to give me money. <laughs> oh, for the extra tuition. Yes, I was going to teach the person mathematics. So there I took Bhagwan, his name is Bhagwan. I took Bhagwan mathematics and he was failing the mathematics before I finished with him one term, he was on top. So in fact, I told myself that it looks like what I know how to do is to teach. And so I want to be a teacher. That's why I want to keep going to university. Because a lot of my classmates and everybody was heading towards Legon or Tech. That was the place to go. Cape Coast mm -hmm. University was not supposed to be a good university at that at time. The time. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I, I was still very well in school anyway. So they wondered, why do you want to go to Cape Coast University? It was, it was a quagma for them. They didn't understand. But for me, because of what Brother William Gates did, it actually told me that what I can do is to help people to understand difficult things. Because I can break it down to the, most, the simplest way. And then if you don't understand, then there's some, there should be something wrong with you. If I handled you, if I, I interacted with you, and you don't understand what I'm trying to see, then there should be something wrong with you, not me. So I said, well, actually, <laughs> that, was, that was what took me to keep you found the, your calling very early. Well, yeah, it was, it was introduced to me by Brother William Gates. The brothers, you know, seniors or elder people can look at a young person and say, I think this guy is has this talent and they can direct you. And that's what I got. And, and because of that, I, I did prelimo. I didn't do this form. So, mm -hmm. so from just form five, I actually applied for prelim and went to do two year prelim for people who had finished A levels or what else. I kept going to university. So you see the drive was so this was this was before your first uh, bachelor de uh, degree. Yes. The prelim, okay. Oh, so you were in Cape Coast for a long time? Yes, I went to first to do a two-year prelim in, in <laughs> 1970, after two years, 72, then I started the BSc. And then the BSc at that time was only for general. Then after that, they said, we're going to do honors. So I did an honors again. So if you see, that's why I have two first degrees. The first degree was BSc education. And then the other one was BSc honors chemistry. At that time, Cape Coast University, you will first do your, your, your general degree before you do the honors on top of it. And I had to go to national service before. I went to sign to do national service before I came to do the honors. OK. And Did after the honors, you went back to teach? After the honors, after the honors, I, I, I actually was, was supposed to have been a TA. And then I was there as a TA. Then I saw an advert in the papers. They were looking for trainee scientific officers at the Atomic Energy Commission. They were being called for applications. So I said, I haven't gone to an interview before, so let me apply. Well, me, I was, I was actually being, being trained to become a, a TA, become a lecturer at Cape Coast University. And then I saw this advert. So I said, well, let me just apply because I haven't gone to an interview before in my life. So I applied and then I went for this interview. When I went, I saw big professors sitting there asking me questions. But Professor Alite was one of them, Professor Tete was there. And the interesting thing that happened was that the first question, I remember it so well, as if it were yesterday. Professor Alite asked me, what is the equation for the electron in the K shell. <laughs> we went into quantum, quantum chemistry, quantum mechanics. So I was to write the equation Hamiltonian for the, an electron in the K shell. I was only a first degree, of course, we did quantum chemistry in the first degree. And I wanted to go to atomic to be a trainee scientific officer to look at nuclear issues, nuclear chemistry, all that. Thing. So the question was, what is the Hamiltonian for an electron in the K-shell? 
And Marianne, this I have said to some people, but I'll, I'll tell you, they gave me a chalk. And so I was to write it on the board. When I turned round, the professors who were sitting there looked to me like my in science secondary school students. <laughs> So I told myself, no, these people, if I just write the equation, they won't understand. So I started to derive the equation. <laughs> so I started from classical mechanics to country mechanics. So I derived the equation, momentum, kinetic energy, what else? When I finished my, my thing, I wrote the equation on the board. This is my first interview. Remember I said that I haven't been to an interview before, so I was going to an interview to test myself. When I finished, all the professors were looking at me and I was standing there. Nobody asked me a question. They said, <laughs> we are finished with you, you can leave. I said, ah, is that how I need to <laughs> You are not sure whether they were impressed or not. Exactly, this is my first interview <laughs> in life. I haven't been to interview. I want to see how an interview feels like. And nobody was asking me any question apart from the one question they asked me, which I don't know whether they will see what I said or not, because, but I thought they would not understand if I wrote the equation, so I derived. And I think that was all that did it. So they said, mm -hmm. I can go. <laughs> I walked out of the room and then the secretary to the meeting He's still alive. He's a good friend of mine, Theophilus Osayantu. He lives in Kumasi now, Theophilus okay. Osayantu. Very good Catholic, a good friend of mine. He walked out of the room. <laughs> I said, Ah, who are you bad? Too fair. Oma for Oma for Kofono, Oma for Oma. I said, What? But I didn't ask you any questions. <laughs> no, you're bad. You're bad. So I walked away. <laughs> He was impressed. <laughs> Everybody was impressed, apparently. <laughs> and later on, it came out to be when I went, finally went to Atomic Energy Commission, my head of the department told me that I was going to go on fellowship, but I shouldn't come back until I get my PhD, until I've gotten my PhD. I should not even try to come back because the <laughs> first practice was that if I come back, it will, I was going to do a master's degree. But if I come back, it might be difficult for me to go back. So because another way to go. Exactly. Mm. So that, was, that was what my head of part told me before even I, I, I went out. But this is, I've jumped. The that issue. was good advice, I think. <laughs> oh, no, well, but they knew the system. And I think they, 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 they thought that I was loaded with potential. So mm. they didn't want to destroy that potential. You know, okay. That was, I think, those were the times when people were, were good. You know, they yeah. Give yeah, good will <laughs> for genuinely good people. Yes. Yeah. They will ask for money to advise you. They will look at you and say, well, this is a potential. Let's groom him or her. These days, nothing has vanished from our society. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how good you are. No, you no. are expected to pay. So this is the unfortunate deterioration of our, our society. But that is the the, the, how I went to Atomic Energy Commission. Okay. So now you're in Atomic Energy and I don't want to go into the very details, but before you went to the US, what was the experience, Prof? Just a little <laughs> bit about the experience. <laughs> well, Since well, your, your, your life story is very loaded. <laughs> well, so, I, start, I want to say everything. You, 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 <laughs> you will not like it, but I will not say everything. You obviously, I'll tell you what you need to hear and I, I, what people need to know. Yes, the, idea, the idea I'm doing this is to, to tell people about possibilities, opportunities, even in the face of challenges. One can make it despite the challenges. Ahead. If you resolve in your mind that you want to do something, the challenges are there, but you can overcome them because intrinsically, we have the ability to overcome challenges. That's what makes us human beings. Yeah. We have the capacity to overcome challenges. So that is what we be. Now, what do you want to do? When I, when I went to Atomic, there's a story about the Atomic Energy Commission. So now let's talk about Atomic Energy Commission. Hey, you, have, 
Maybe you are there a bit late, yes. Okay. And Mr. Brown, may he rest in peace. JPH Brown was the chemistry head, who was the one waiting for me. So when I went, he said, oh, you have come, they were happy. They gave me a place, I had a house and everything. And then they took, I, took, I went to the chemistry building. The chemistry building was almost in the state of dilapidation, atomic at that time. Now they have converted that place into a hostel. But mm -hmm. at that time, it was the only, for that's the place, the building that started the atomic energy. So the, the, the stones and the concrete were well to prevent radiation leaking out of the building. So chemistry and the place are deteriorated. But I sat in a small, they gave me a small desk with a distance. And I, I, I was I was a principal scientific officer. If I at that time, I was the highest scientific officer. I think at the beginning you were the trainee. No trainee. Ah, this is a trainee. This is yeah. before the I, US. I didn't go and come back, yes. Yeah. I was a trainee. So so what I went, um who uh DPH. Said that there is an experiment that I want you to do called Freaky Experiment, if you know the Freaky Experiment. So we have to go to take it to the reactor. And then, but most of the time, what were we doing? Nothing. Most of the people were working Lotto. Because, <laughs> no, seriously. And most of the people were actually waiting for an IAEA, okay. the National Atomic Energy Agency okay, Scholarship, to go out. For okay. training, because I was a trainee, I was going to be trained. So the applications came and I applied, and I was designated to go and learn about nuclear reactor chemistry. So what it meant is that you know Ghana was going to buy a three, uh, no, a five megawatt polystyrene reactor from Germany. And so I was going to study the chemistry, and it's a swimming pool reactor. The swimming pool reactor, the, 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 what do you call it? The rods, the fuel rods are in, submerged into water. And when it hits criticality, the reactor will, will continue. But the ions in the solution of what in the, in the swimming pool increase upon, upon usage. So as a chemist, I was going to cleanse the water, determine the various ions, the chemicals that are in, and then methods for cleaning, you know, using chromatograph, ion exchange, ion exchange, or any method that we could be using to clean the water for reuse. So that was what I was going to Buffalo to learn because the reactor that we we're going to buy from Germany was had a similar, there was a similar reactor in Buffalo. Okay. So I was to go and go to Buffalo to use the reactor which Ghana was going to acquire. In anticipation of exactly. what we were doing. I will come back to use that knowledge to, to really perform for our country. This is very, very forward thinking at the time. I think the management Exactly. This is what you need. <laughs> Buffalo, you know, two megawatt polestar reactor. And Buffalo had the same, they were using it to do New England, yeah, a new New England nuclear. They were making isotopes and selling them in Buffalo, sunny Buffalo. So I was going to learn this, this chemistry and then bring the technology back home. You know, when I left, the professor whom I went to meet in Buffalo had gotten an award to go to California. So he was leaving. <laughs> so that's another part of the story. If you want to, I'll tell you <laughs> later on. Yes, you can, you can continue from there, Prof. So, okay, so, so, so you are now in Buffalo. No, you can try to get a scholarship and I went to Buffalo. I arrived there, I think, 26th August 1980. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then they took me to Professor Chong, who was my, my supervisor. I hear scholarship, you get everything, the supervisor, everything, the university. I was going to do MSc Engineering Science. Okay. That was my subject that I got it to do in Buffalo. I went there, the professor was going to California. So <laughs> he, he, he says he can't take me to Buffalo, uh, to California, because that year's scholarship was tenable in Buffalo. And the and reactor he, that he needed to work with was also so, in <laughs> so he couldn't take me to, to defeat the purpose for which. So he and said, well, there is a nuclear chemist. When I look at your background, 
you're actually a chemist. So mm -hmm. there's a nuclear chemist in the chemistry department. Since I'm leaving, I'm going to take you to him. And if he takes you, or if he is interested in you, then, then you become his student in the chemistry department. So I can leave and you still can continue pursue a degree in nuclear chemistry. So that is how come Professor Chong took me chong, 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 to the laboratory of <laughs> Jacob Akiba Marinsky. <laughs> I went to my Marinsky's office and then the story was told. This African guy had come, he wanted to do this, but I'm leaving. So his background is intrinsically chemistry. So you can actually pick him. Marinsky said, well, luckily tomorrow there is an exam for all <laughs> that we have admitted, qualifying exam. So James can go and take the exam. And if he does well, he'll be picked. I had been working Lotto in the Atomic Energy Commission. For <laughs> you years. are not part of the Lotto state. <laughs> I traveled the next day, I'm going to write an exam. I mean, I'd be rusty. So, so so, well, Prof, let me backtrack a bit. Between the time you were hired to your PhD, how long did it take? Hired to my PhD. The time you uh, were hired at Atomic and then you, your departure to the US. Oh, how long? Atomic, I was there uh, 78 and I left, it, and I told you, I, had, I left 1980. 18. So, so about two, two years. Two years there, yeah. Two years okay. there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, <laughs> uh, we, I don't even know where I am now. So you want to write the exam? Marinsky has yes, recommended yes. that you should no, no, join I have not, the exam. I'm not going to write the exam. I just said, where is the library? So, so <laughs> we, and I went. And, and luckily for me, and I'll say lucky, but Marinsky kept on telling me, I said, lucky, I'll let me cut this in. I said I was lucky, but Marinsky, as a professor and a Jewish professor, said, James, there's nothing like luck. You utilize an opportunity that was made available to you. So when you're able to convert an opportunity into something meaningful, you don't have to call it luck because some other people will have gotten the same opportunity and they will have blown it. So Marinsky put this in my head. That's the except. Now I'll go to write this exam. So library, they showed me a library. It was going to be physical chemistry. And that's my story. So I went and I read some few Schrodinger equations here, there, you know, and then I went to the exam the next day. Just from that, on the two hours preparation. When I went, <laughs> the exam came, and I was sitting somewhere, Marisi Kim said, look. He came only yesterday from Africa. You know the connotation, Africa. Yeah. <laughs> the jungle. <laughs> You've beaten so many of the students that we have admitted. You have done better than them. In fact, if you turn up for the fact that you, you, you came late, we have really given you a TA ship, teaching assistant ship, because you have beaten a lot of people that were going to pay monies on. To become to your fellowship. Yeah, yes, but I had a fellowship, so mm -hmm. it was not going to be immediately. Of the first time, semester when I finished, they gave me TA in addition to my fellowship. <laughs> I was so impressed. And Jack Marinsky will write this in every recommendation that he wrote for me. If you go like this, James came from Africa and the next day he wrote, he wrote an exam and he beat more than 80% of the students. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That very skill route for me, <laughs> this line will appear. Okay, this so <laughs> on that uh, line, can, pro, please continue your relationship with Marinsky and uh, your, your PhD journey. So I started, <laughs> I went to his lab, and then there was one senior in his lab. He was, Marinsky was, was, was aged. I mean, he was not aged, but he was, he was of age. He was, he was a professor emeritus. Who is Marinsky? Marinsky is the co-discoverer of element 61, Prometheum. If he gave it the name Prometheum, and he will tell you, the first thing he will tell you is the story about how the name came about. How, and it's a long story, 
but I, it's not, it doesn't belong here. Yeah. It's a long yeah. story. So I was working on poly hydro, poly, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And then in the, in, in the process, he was looking at ion exchange resins, polystyrene, and so forth. But Marinsky was looking at metal composition and using what he called the Schubert method and looking for stability constants of ligands binding to metals and even ion exchange to, to, to determine the stability constants. And it was fantastic, basically mathematical in nature, which was something that I'm naturally interested in. So we went, we went on a number of things, but the exciting thing about Marinsky was that a lot of professors did not understand him. Marinsky was starting a class with 700 students. In America, when you're a student and you're a class at the lecturer, it's difficult. You can change the class. You can go to the next class because classes are, mm -hmm. are, are given. Marinsky will start with 700 students. By the time he finishes, about 350 are left. <laughs> Half of them will have run away. But only the bright ones will stay with Marinsky because he approaches the thing in a way that, in fact, you have to be sharp to get what he's trying to say. His, his mind is way ahead of him. When he's talking about things now, he, he thinks he's at five he yards does. ahead of his career. He's coming an element here. Yeah. That must be yeah, some yeah. exceptional person. No, 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 yeah, he, he's, he's, his mind, he's, he thinks very fast. So he goes fast and you, you have missed it. You are, you are listening to him and you don't get it. So what I did to him that he loved was that he, when he's ahead of himself, I will stop him. I said, Jack, <laughs> Jack, come back. Here, here. How did you go from here to here to this place? Then you will see that you had made him say, said, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I heard shit about one million times. I was telling somebody yesterday, I'm sitting <laughs> in the alone. In the class. <laughs> no, this one is as a, as a student of his. When I go, from there, I said, I'll hear shit about 100 times. <laughs> can you imagine coming from, America, from Ghana and the professor? Saying that, yeah. Yes, shit, shit all the time. I mean, that was so just inappropriate. <laughs> I was so confused. Why, what have I done wrong? Just not <laughs> wrong. What is this shit, shit for? But he was shit himself. Yes. Yes. Then he said, I used, to, I used to do this so easily. Now it is it is almost impossible to. That was the shit that he was yeah. saying. <laughs> And I did, but I didn't understand. He was out so of frustration, then he exactly. he's worse. <laughs> yeah. When so, we... so Pop, did you abandon the original plan, the project plan, which was to work in the reactor? No, no, I, I abandoned it. But what happened was that in the nine exchange uh, experiments that we did, all my analysis was done in that reactor building. So okay. the because they, they, they had the Canberra you know, multi-channel analyzer. So every radioactive material, you have to take it there to that place. So I was taking all my samples to that reactor. And the people knew me already because that was my first place. So when I went there, they gave me a special treatment. I was a very special student for the reactor building. And everything mm -hmm. they wanted, they would take me through and whatnot. So they made my decision very exciting. Would uh, Prof, uh, would you like to maybe summarize your experience, your PhD experience in three key points or key areas? Well, what I discovered was that um, it's hard work. And, and as I told you, there's no need for, for you to think about um, luck. Okay, so you, readiness, hard, hard work. work. And resilience. And resilience. And so it was, it was crucial, it's very important for you to see ahead of you what you want to achieve. If you, if you do that already, it means you can already see what is to be achieved. And when you can see that which is to be achieved, it is, it is, already, create, it is already there because See, there's nothing that is in this world or what, which has not been created first in the mind. So if you create that in your mind already, that achievement, then you walk towards it. So I, I learned from, from, from that. that's my, And Marisco 
you know, it's nothing like love. Just work towards the perceived goal, and you'll be shocked okay. to arrive at it. All right, thank you. Um, Prof, did you go to the U.S. as a family man, or it was later that you started went, the family? Yes, I went there as a, a single person. And then, and then six months later, my wife joined. Okay. Would you like to talk about that, about family and how that influences your studies as a graduate student? Maybe for someone in a, a similar situation who wants to learn from your experience. No, actually, it, it is sacrifice. For example, if you are so busy trying to, to see the eye of the needle and get to meet <laughs> Mm -hmm. and you have a family, and the woman also wants to see I have the needle of what loss, then there will be, the problem will be twofold. So somebody you had to sacrifice to ensure that we are taken. And that is what my wife did. Mm -hmm. She really was the backbone, did everything, suspended everything that she has to do so that I could achieve what I had, so that it becomes a collective thing. Mm, so that your children also have a stable yeah, home yeah. to go to. Yes, and that was the cardinal point. And for that, I'll say um, I was lucky. Mm. Thank you very much, Madam, for being the backbone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I I will assume that you have completed your PhD. Did, did you complete on record time? Did you make any? Did you achieve any? Special no, accolades in the course of your PhD awards or anything like that. No, my professor was actually approaching retirement, so okay. he, he was traveling to Switzerland, Italy, Sweden, and whatnot. In fact, he was actually a difficult person to understand, <laughs> and I was the only one who understood him. And that worked to my detriment in a way that he was not ready to let me leave the lab. You can imagine. I finished my, my thesis writing, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and then the results and whatnot. He sat on his table and he it took, it took almost a year for him to, to really get it done for me. Because he did it, I was then the only person managing his lab. I got another student to come and join, and I was now supervising, buying his chemicals, managing everything that was going on. So he didn't want me to go. You know how I did it? I wrote an acknowledgement. And that acknowledgement is what actually made him bring my thesis back to me. I wrote that I am very grateful to Professor Marinsky for his support, especially during the preparation of this thesis. And I sent it to him. Okay, I was prof. I was asking about you, how you exited your PhD journey. Whether you received, I was like maybe best researcher or any of those. So whether you attended <laughs> some conferences oh, along yeah. the way. Conferences, I went. I read plenty. I read plenty. All the publications, I I, I presented them at New Hampshire, Colorado, Essex Park, and Buffalo. So I, I went plenty of them. Okay, but all within the US? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So I, you completed your PhD in five years, I guess. Oh, yes, was yes. It? Yeah, it was, was supposed to be four years, but you know, he delayed me. That's why I wrote, I wrote, I, I was telling you about how I wrote a nice acknowledgement that I want to thank Professor Marinsky, especially during the preparation of this thesis. Meanwhile, the thesis has been sitting with him for long and he had not done anything about it. When that acknowledgement went, within a week, I got my thesis completely done. <laughs> okay. I, I thanked him in advance, and I said, especially, <laughs> especially during the preparation of this thesis. And I think that's actually... No, I think it. I learned that from you once when we were drafting a letter and you said, Mishida, thank you for the anticipated positive response. Yeah, <laughs> So somehow you corner the person to be positive in your response. You have to, you, you have to actually give your question because you are really thank you for it. So viewers and listeners, this is the end of 
part one of our conversation with Professor James Hawkins Ephraim. Stay tuned for part two, which will be about his post-PAD experience and then life after that.